um, I'm John Coles, I'm the Headmaster Director of Halebury Astana and my esteemed colleague is... Faye Fraser, the Head of Sixth Form and also overseeing the University Guidance. And today um, we're just going to have a, a small chat about um, applying to universities, uh, particularly in England, uh, but also then expanding into other universities. So. We've got some questions which have been sent to us by students actually, so we thought we would talk about these. So the first one is, what is UCAS? They over to you. So, UCAS stands for Universities and Colleges Admissions Service. Yep. And the way that students apply is there is an online platform, it's very straightforward, it's very intuitive, students fill in their details, I have access to it, or the UCAS coordinator has access to it, and we guide and support students along the way. Okay, now we know that a lot of our students will also apply to European and American universities, and actually the UCAS process is a little bit easier. Can you explain to our audience how it's different? I think for the American universities in particular, they use, the majority of them use a platform called Common App. Now this is more complex in nature in comparison to the UCAS uh, application process. U US universities ask for motivational essays, specific essay titles. They ask for two subject references, whereas in the UK they only require one reference which is written, it's a culmination of all of your subject teachers in one letter essentially. Yeah, so they, are, they ask for a personal statement. And with the UK, when you apply on UCAS, you write one personal statement, which kind of goes to all the universities, and then you send that off. Whereas Absolutely. in America, you have individual things for different universities. Okay. So the one which we always get asked is, what are the essential tips for the application process? And the first thing I would always say is, um, make sure you're applying for a course you actually want to do. Agreed. Because if you are applying for a course which your friends are applying to or your parents are telling you to apply to, you've then got to go to university for however many years, and that could be three or, or four years, and you will have a miserable time. And your chances of probably not succeeding are increased because you're not in doing it. So the first thing is make sure you understand um, that you want to do it. The second thing I think is very much my advice is do your homework. Um, the days nowadays, you have so much information, and I'll ask you to tell about it. Now, we use Unifrog, don't we? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Can you tell me a little about Unifrog? So, Unifrog is Google for universities. Yeah. Not only for universities, actually, just for careers in general. Uh, students can search by subject, they can search by country, they can search by university, they can search by career. And within this platform, they have access to TED Talks. Um, interviews with alumni from specific colleges, specific universities around the world, not just in the UK. It also gives students a chance to gather information about themselves on there as a platform whereby their date of birth, their transcripts, their report cards, um, their address, do they need student finance, all these different things and then I can guide them, take it from there into the UCAS platform. And I think the advantage of Unifrog is in the world today where we have so much information, I remember when I went to university, um, I remember coming to a, a university careers library yes. that had all these books <laughs> and I was told, just go read them. Um, there are so many courses, so I did geography, but there are hundreds of different types of geography courses. Nowadays, Unifrog helps bring that down. Yeah. Okay. The other thing I'd also recommend is, and obviously we know we now live in a digital world, you can find out a lot of um, student chat rooms about universities. And actually you can talk to some of the graduates there and find out what you want. Now, you need to think about your university. Do you want a city-based university? Do you want a rural-based university? What do you want to get out of it? Because whilst you want the academic studies, which are important, you've got to live there for three or four years. And if you are a person who wants to go out and socialise and that type of thing, and you pick a rural university, you might be disappointed. And the other thing you've got to think about is cost. Cost is very That's important. That's the biggest thing. You can't just think, right, this is the cost of the course. If, for example, you decide to choose London, your living costs will probably be five times more expensive than if you choose a rural 
university in England. So if you are going to a city-based university, think about cost. Now, if you're going for the US or other countries, they can tend to have scholarships, which can help. The UK doesn't have that many scholarships, so you've got to be aware of that. It's the unhidden, or sorry, it's the hidden costs which many students forget. Yep. They go, oh, I can't afford that. Yep. If you're flying back to Kazakhstan, you've got to build in your flights. You've got to build in your accommodation. You've got to build in your food. Um, what else have you got to build? Medical. Medical. Lots of things you've got to do. So in terms of tips, do your homework. And I think whoever you talk to, um, make sure you talk to someone who knows what they're doing. Okay, talk to a professional, um, for example, yeah, no, I agree. And also the admissions people that actually work for the universities are very friendly. Yeah. Uh, more often than not, they're actually current students at the university. So they have a very, very honest uh, opinion of the university and they can give you really, really relevant and up-to-date information. I also think from working with our year 13 students this year, I really managed to get the students to understand about having a plan A, a plan B yeah. and a plan C. We all know that things can come out of nowhere, COVID-19, for example, yeah. and it's really good to have a backup plan. Yeah. Yes, we have those REACH universities, the dreams, uh, I want to go to King's College, or for example, but you also should always have, you have five choices in total on the UCAS platform, and for me, I would say that at least two of them are a backup plan, just in case things don't go particularly to plan. Yeah, I think that's important. I think the other thing you need to be aware of is, you know, you look at universities, you look at where you're going to live, you look at the cost. Um, you have to be proactive. Yes. You are no longer 11 year old, you are going to be leaving university. If you have a question about university, phone them up. Yes. You contact them. Yeah. Don't ask your teacher to do it. Yeah. Because that means you haven't got the ability. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, the next one we get asked is extra extracurricular activities or uh, CCAs. Now, why are they important? Okay, why are you applying to university? You're applying to university because you want to study, in my case, it was geography. So in my personal statement, I talked a lot about my passion for geography. I'd done a lot of reading um, outside of the curriculum, and I explained that. But I also have to include in my personal statement a little bit about me. Yep. And a university wants to have students who will come and join them, who will get involved in their student life, who will lead clubs, who will be leaders, and then go on and be hopefully successful. So there's a whole range of things. Now you've got the obvious ones such as sport. That's a good team leadership thing. But in Kazakhstan, in our school, we've got a lot of children who are entrepreneurs. That's interesting. Being involved in charity work or whatever, showing that you care about others than just yourself, again, is powerful things. If you're here in this video and you think, well, actually, I don't do any of those, okay, we're all different, we're all unique. What else do you do outside of school which you think might be of interest to a university admissions tutor? Yeah. And that's the key thing. Absolutely. And for me, being obviously heavily involved with the IB program, the CAS part of the core, creativity, action and service, the reason why this is so brilliant for our students and excellent opportunity is because if we think about it, gone are the days of knowledge being power. We have Google now. Google is power. What I believe students really need to start taking on board is if they can develop new skills, if they can get to sixth form at 17 years old, 16, 17 years old and develop a new skill, that is what universities and future employ employers are looking for, is what, what are you going to do for me? How are you going to help my company grow? I know that you know everything because we know Google, but what is it that you're going to physically do? I mean. Music, again, I forgot to mention, music is fantastic. Yep. It doesn't have to be your traditional orchestra. What happens if you like music, playing in a band, music tech, all those type of things? Yeah. You need to show that you have other things other than just yeah. studying academic. That makes you attractive to a university. Oh. Right, our next question which we've been asked is about standardised tests and what should I pass? Okay. The most important one it's obviously your high school qualification. Yes. Very important, guys, getting a good IB diploma. 
But the second most important one would be IELTS. Now, IELTS is a English, English language proficiency test. Places such as the British Council will have testing centres. They will also have revision sessions, catch-up sessions, where students can practice what the IELTS examination is. You'll be given a test score, maybe 7, 7.5. And when it comes to applying to university, not just in the UK, we're talking about the entire world, they will ask you not only for your IB diploma score, but for your IELTS score. Now, if you have a European passport, for example, you may be exempt. Some students, because at Haley Astana, for example, we teach in English. And if students have chosen English as a higher level subject for their language A, that means they've studied language and literature. They're pretty proficient in the English language. They've also studied all of their sciences in English. So for some universities, that would be enough. However, my advice is everybody in year 12 just take the IELTS examination. Yes, I think you're right. Um, it's something, whether you are proficient in English or not, <laughs> a lot of universities will accept it. Or yes. just expect it, sorry. Um, so be prepared for that one. Right. Now, the next question we get asked is, what subject should I do at IB for universities? Now, the majority of, and I was certainly one of these teenagers, doesn't know what they want to do. And if you ask someone who has got the ability and say, yes, I want to be a doctor, great. We know exactly what subjects you want to do. If you want to be an engineer, well, you're looking at physics, maths, further maths. That's basically what your key subjects. But most people don't know. Now, the beauty of the IB programme is, in comparison to other um, sick form programmes, it keeps a whole range open. And you will have the different groups. Yep. And in those groups, you will see the ones which you can choose. Again, it comes back to subjects. Choose the ones you like. So, if you want to be a doctor and you don't like chemistry and biology, <laughs> forget it. It's not going to happen. No. Um, if you want to be an architect or an engineer and you don't like physics, yeah, it's not going to not happen. happen. Certain subjects have to do it. On the whole, however, because you will do your languages, you'll do your sciences, you'll do your humanities, because you're doing the whole range package, it means, unlike A-levels, where you are limiting it down to a smaller choice, the IB programme allows you a lot more. And universities know that. And therefore, from the IB programme, you can apply for a much wider range. Agreed. And, you know, just to add on to that, some students get a little bit anxious about, well, how can I then, if I have to take six subjects, for example, how can I show my university what it is I'm really good at? Now, obviously, with the IB, you take three higher level subjects. Now, those are the three that you would highlight, for example. You talked about studying medicine, chemistry and biology higher level yes. and the ones at standard level are maybe the subjects that you are trying for the first time for example music music teacher out there um, you don't have to have studied music before taking it at IB level now my advice to that would be have some sort of musical passion some sort of practice ability there however you can then take that as an SL subject a standard level subject less pressure and it also shows the universities you've got like you said, the holistic, broad range of subjects. Now, we've just talked about higher level and standard level subjects. Not everyone might know what we're talking about. So what is the difference between the two? So within the IB programme, higher level subjects, it's kind of in the name, I guess, they expect a higher standard of work. The knowledge required is deeper. Yep. The coursework required is greater. The examinations could be longer. So it really is taking a subject and instead of having only three lessons a week, you have four. And then standard level subjects you take three times a week and the expectations aren't as much. The quantity isn't as much. I think that the key word is your, your knowledge. Absolutely. At a higher level subject, you will go into a greater depth of knowledge. Absolutely. So they're the ones which you want to pick as the ones you enjoy the most. Yes. And that's important. Yes. Right. Final question is how to make the right choice while choosing an educational programme. And we've kind of touched on this before, so let's just summarise. One, make sure you're choosing something you want to do. Cannot. Two, do your homework. That means you have got to do the research. So it's not, if you, it's your life. For the next mm. three to four years, or even longer for medicine. Yes. If you don't do the homework now, you're going to get things wrong. 
talk to somebody who knows what they're talking about. Okay. Um, talk to the university is a good one. Talk to some actual students. Don't believe everything you read on social media. <laughs> it is not necessarily correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, what else? Anything else? I just think that looking at university being a lifestyle, yeah. rather than it just being going to school. Um, unless you're very lucky, your parents aren't going to go with you, they're not going to wash your clothes, they're not going to do all this, that and the other. So halls of residence, yeah. where you choose to stay. Um, my university, Kingston University, the halls of residence weren't actually where I studied. Um, I didn't do very good research, but I would have preferred it if I could have rolled out of bed and then gone straight to lectures, <laughs> rather than having to roll out of bed, sit on a bus for 45 minutes, and go to a lecture. Yeah. So doing all these things, and the internet now is wonderful. I mean, you can just find out any any aspects, any information, finding out how old are the halls of residence, for example. What are the facilities like? Sports yeah. facilities, clubs, like you said before. Yeah, I think so. One thing you've got to be assume is, don't always assume the accommodation is going to be on campus. Yes. <laughs> you might say, I want to live in a halls of residence, which is kind of more of a, a university community. Or you might say, actually, I want to live in a flat, yeah. which in some of the cities is where most of the students live. Mm. So rather than living with a large number of students, you might actually be living with a few students. Um, there's whole things you've got to look at. The other thing I would also say is um, you can visit most of these things like virtual tours. Give it time and look at it. Mm. Don't get drawn by, oh, they've got a nice swimming pool, they've got a nice... <laughs> look at where their graduates go afterwards. What's their employment? Are they employable? And the universities will be very keen to publish that. Mm. You want to be doing a course, which means that when you come out of that, you've got the best chance of getting your job. Mm. And actually getting your dream job in your career is tough. We know that 20 years ago, most people did probably four jobs. Now that, that is changing. Some of you will be doing jobs which don't even exist at the moment. So find a course which you enjoy, which creates creativity and thinking skills, and also makes you marketable when you finish. Yeah, absolutely. And I think for me, choosing music at university, um, through my wider reading and my listening, my listening, I had to do it for my, for my music courses, um, I actually chose Kingston because of the lecturers I knew I'd have. They motivated me and inspired me because of their own musical background. So I think for especially creative subjects like that, it was important for me because I knew what I wanted to study. I wanted to study composition. Therefore, I didn't want a lecturer that wrote music that I didn't like. So really delving into who is it that's going to be teaching you? What is your life going to look like? What's it going to feel like? So we've answered the questions which kind of get asked the most. We hope you've enjoyed this. Um, if you've got any more questions, please do send them in. And um, hey, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much.